Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, for this week's seminar, we have Minia um, speaking on um, quantum effects and gravity beyond the future potential. Uh, Puni is from ETH Zurich and has uh, many works on quantum reference frames and has recently and, and also uh, quantum effects and gravity. Um, so uh, I look forward to, to this talk. Uh, Flaminia, please uh, take it away. Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks a lot also for uh, inviting me to present this work here. So I'm, I'm very happy. And so this, this work is, uh, is actually very recent. And it was done in collaboration with Ling Chin Chan, who was a postdoc until uh, two weeks ago here at TTH Zurich. And she now moved to Vienna. And um, so the, we're going to talk about quantum effects in gravity. And in particular, we're going to ask the following question. Imagine that you have a source of gravity, so a mass, and you put it in a quantum superposition state of two positions here and there. Then you would like to know what this implies for the quantum nature of the gravitational field. So this is the very general scope of this talk. And in particular, we're going to look at some uh, new effects that we found. So let me start very broadly. And uh, we have two very successful theories. The, on the one hand, we have quantum theory. And on the other hand, we have general relativity. And these two theories, so roughly we can say that quantum theory is the theory that deals with entanglement and superposition, while general relativity is the theory that deals with the relation between gravity and matter. In a slogan, we can say that matter tells space time how to curve and space time tells matter how to move. And the, the, uh, these two theories can predict extremely well the outcome of all current experiments. But they are radically different in their uh, in their structure. So, for instance, quantum theory is probabilistic in the measurement, and general relativity is a deterministic theory. So, the now there is an effort uh, in trying to combine these two of them into a theory that is usually called the theory of quantum gravity. But we immediately run into a problem. That is that all experiments we have so far are compatible with quantum theory and general relativity taken separately. So there is no single experiment at the moment that tells us that we have to go beyond these two theories. So this doesn't look very promising. And uh, usually the reason is uh, uh, stated as that uh, quantum gravity effects, so they combine the effects, so that the, the place where we should look, be looking for a more general theory is uh, uh, at the high energies and at the Planck scale, that is 10 to the minus 35 meters. So it's something that is extremely far from the current experimental uh, precision that we have at the moment. So, uh, this is not the only way in which we can look for quantum effects in gravity. There is also another possibility that is to look at the low energies when gra where gravity can be described as a weak field uh, theory. And also we can still make sense of quantum particles. So this is the regime that we will address in this talk. So it has nothing to do with Planck scale physics. And, but it, it is interesting because we can ask the same conceptual questions as in quantum gravity. So there are shared open questions, but the, there are concrete physical situations that we can imagine and that we can realize in the laboratory. And we will see that the, the meaning of quantum when applied to gravity is different than what is usually uh, thought to be in quantum gravity. Um, so let us look now at the fundamental equations of general relativity that are Einstein's equations. So these equations tell us the relation between gravity and matter. In particular, here on the left-hand side, we have the uh, equations. So we have the metric content of the theory, so the space-time. While on the right-hand side, we have the matter content of the theory. So this is the stress-energy tensor. 
But it is important to remark that these equations hold when matter is classical. But now let us turn to quantum theory. Quantum theory tells us that we shouldn't have a classical stress energy tensor, but that matter is quantum. So in the end, we would like to replace uh, this classical stress energy tensor with a quantum stress energy tensor. But as soon as we try to plug a quantum operator here on the right hand side, we immediately run into a problem. So these equations are not consistent anymore. So how can we solve that? So there are at least three possibilities. The first one is that the left hand side should become quantum two, and that's the approach that most uh, uh, most physicists uh, would follow, and that uh, like also the, all all attempts to quantize gravity um, uh, look after. Or there is a possibility that actually matter, uh, sorry, gravity is fundamentally classical. And this means that you have to modify quantum theory in order to keep these equations overall classical. And this is what alternative models uh, like Schrodinger Newton equation, collapse models, gravitational decoherence, and so on uh, attempt to do. But finally, there is also the possibility that this is totally something else that we do not know. And the, the thing is now, the question that is relevant is how do we experimentally distinguish between all these possibilities? So what is the signature that we should be looking for in an experiment in order to understand what this gravitational field is in this case? And this question became rele uh, relevant recently in the past 10 years uh, because of experiments. So, um, experiments have made tremendous progress and are now trying to uh, approach the regime in which we can finally test these effects. What do I mean? So we can roughly divide two different directions in experiments. Uh, here on the left-hand side, we have an experiment that has nothing quantum, just purely gravitational. And this is in Marcus Aspelmeyer group in Vienna. And uh, so this experiment uh, is basically a Cavendish experiment where they take two masses, they let them interact gravitationally, and they show that they are a source of gravity because they interact, they attract each other gravitationally. The thing is that these masses are extremely small. Each one is 90 milligram, and that's the state of the art at the moment. And if you look at it, so this is a one cent coin, uh, and this is the this dot, this uh, golden dot here is the mass that they are that they use as a source mass. Then on the on the right hand side, there are instead experiments that go the opposite direction. So they start quantum and they try to show that quantum properties hold at more and more macroscopic scales. So this can be done in different ways. For instance, by increasing the mass that you put in a quantum superposition, this is, for instance, a sophisticated version of the double slit experiment, or by increasing the size of the superposition. And this is an atom interferometer, so it's a single atoms that are put at a superposition whose distance is half a meter. In the end, the goal is to bridge these two regimes and to show that you can prepare a quantum source of gravity so something that uh, sources a gravitational field like here in a quantum superposition state. This is not something that will be done tomorrow, but there are like uh, research programs in experiments that are trying to achieve that. So it's something that we, uh, that we have within our horizon. So now the question for a theorist is uh, what can we learn and uh, actually, how can we be sure that we require a quantum description of gravity? And this is not a new question. So this is a question that goes back at least to 1957 at the Chapel Hill conference. And so this conference was actually extremely interesting because it gathered the major experts of uh, the field in gravity at the time to uh, basically boost the research in gravity that they felt was being neglected. And uh, so there is a famous point in the conference where they discuss whether it is required to quantize gravity. 
And then Feynman comes up with a thought experiment that goes as follows. So here we you have a Stergerlach apparatus whose role is basically to take a one centimeter ball uh, and Feynman is very specific. He wants a one centimeter ball because at the time they had measured the gravitational field sourced by this ball. And through the Sterger like apparatus, they, he imagines that uh, you can put this ball in a quantum superposition state of two positions, up and down. Now Feynman continues, well, we know that there is a gravitational field associated to the ball. So if the ball is in a quantum superposition, then there should be an amplitude that the gravitational field is up and an amplitude that the gravitational field is down. So now you have to test whether this is true. And the way he proposes to do is to put another ball and a test particle this time, so something that does not back react on the gravitational field, let it interact with the former, with the big ball, the blue ball, and then uh, measure an interference. So basically, this would be the generation of entanglement in modern language. He doesn't say, uh, he doesn't use the word entanglement explicitly, but that's what he meant. So in the end, he concludes that if you believe in quantum mechanics up to any level, then you have to believe in gravitational quantization in order to describe this experiment. So notice that for Feynman, gravitational quantization does not mean a full quantum theory of gravity, but it only means that the gravitational field has a quantum state so that it can be in a quantum superposition state. And this is the same sense in which we will talk about the quantum nature of the gravitational field in the following. So it has no relation to the Planck scale. So let me just pause for a moment and let us ask, but why are we bothering so much about gravity and we are not bothering at all about electromagnetism? We use a quantum theory of electromagnetism and everybody's happy. So the reason is that we have bothered about that. And actually there was a discussion that lasted uh, 70 years roughly uh, around the same question in electromagnetism. And this started from the photoelectric effect. So basically what happened is that um, since uh, the photoelectric effect, there were uh, effects, electromagnetic effects that were uh, claimed to be purely quantum. And then somebody came up with a theory that could explain them keeping a classical nature for the field, for the electromagnetic field, and just the quantum, a quantum nature of matter. And in particular, in the 60s, there was a semi-classical theory of radiation by Jaynes and collaborators, Crisp and Cummings, um, where uh, they could explain basically all the effects that, all the electromagnetic effects that existed so far. Even though, of course, in those times, QED was used and uh, it did, like, on, a, on a regular basis. So the experiment that closed the debate only came in 1974, as you can see here. So it's relatively recent uh, and it was performed by John Closer. And uh, as, as you can see from the title, he experimentally distinguishes between quantum and classical field theoretic predictions for the photoelectric effect. And the way he did that is to basically build four detectors. So he has an interferometer with four detectors. He looks at correlations of correlation of intensities. And then he calculates the, uh, the correlation function between uh, uh, these intensities. And if the electromagnetic field is classical, then you cannot violate this inequality. So this quantity has to be greater than one. But then he shows that he can find a value that is zero for these correlations. And hence, this can only be explained with a quantum theory of the electromagnetic field. So in particular, notice that uh, this, uh, this equation is a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So it is the analogous of a Bell inequality. Okay, so this is for what concerns electromagnetism. Now, let us jump forward a few years 
we are in 2017 with these two proposals that are along uh, like Feynman's thought experiment, just a modern version. Um, so the, the difference with what I showed to you before is that here the authors consider um, two sources of gravity, the blue one and the red one, and each of them is prepared initially in a quantum superposition state. So x1 and x2 and some uh, other x1 plus d, x2 plus d for b. And okay, and it's a product state. Now, let us imagine that they interact via the Newton potential for some time. So we just evolved the state using the usual Schrodinger equation with the Newton interaction. After some time, if everything works as planned, as the Schrodinger equation tells us, we find an entangled state uh, where we have these, uh, uh, like, well, uh, basically the, these are the same uh, vectors as we have here. And here we have a phase that depends on the strength of the interaction here. So now there is a quantum information theorem that is called the LOCC theorem that states that local operations and classical communication cannot generate entanglement. So this means that if you treat gravity as the mediator of your interaction, then you conclude that gravity is not a classical channel. So that's their argument. And since then, many people have worked on, on this question. And uh, so one thing that I would like to stress here is that all the, all the proposals that we have uh, for this uh, type of uh, effect in gravity use the Newton interaction in order to uh, generate the, the entanglement between the two masses. Now, let us look at some experimental parameters uh, that they estimate in the paper. So the entanglement rate that depends on the phase, basically, is given by this expression here. So this is the velocity. So basically, it quantifies how long it takes for the two masses to become entangled. So now, if we take two masses that are 10 to the minus 5 grams, and, with the, and we put them at 100 micrometers uh, distant one from the other, and we delocalize each of them by one nanometer. So these are ambitious numbers. So this cannot be done now in the laboratory. Then we find an entanglement time of 0 0.1 seconds, which is good. So this is the, the reason that pushes also the, the research now into thinking of this type of effect and that motivates why this is, a, this is a hopeful path for experiments. But now there is the usual objection. The, the first objection that can be raised against this is, wait a second. Here, you only use the Newton potential to generate entanglement. What do you want to tell me if you only use the Newton potential? And um, so let us look at the limitations of why, like why people think that the Newton potential is not uh, a good way of showing any quantum feature of the nature of gravity. I will not review all the um, opinions that are around. I will just tell you some pros and cons and according to my own view. So it's a very personal selection. So one, the first thing that we can say is that let us consider, so we, it's true, we have the Newton potential, this is, but this is not the end of, of the story. So we know that we have general relativity. So one thing that we can do is to embed the Newton potential into a more general theory of general relativity. So general, if we take general relativity and for gravity and quantum mechanics for uh, and by general relativity, I really mean general relativity, not any modification of, of it, uh, and quantum mechanics for matter, then classical general relativity and quantum mechanics does not generate entanglement. And this statement can also be quantified in a theory-independent way with an Ogo theorem. However, let us look just at what the experiment tells us. 
So let us be more conservative and let us just look at what we can deduce from the experiment by itself. So clearly in the experiment, we are not using the full power of general relativity, but we are only using its limit to the Newton potential that is a weak uh, field and no relativistic limit. So now, if, uh, if we only look at that, then this effect is fully compatible with the weak field and a no relativistic limit of general relativity. So this means that if we measure this effect, then the best statement that we can do is that, uh, well, if we use the full apparatus of GR plus quantum mechanics, we cannot uh, get entanglement, but we have no idea in which direction we should modify that because the effect that we find is still compatible with this uh, particular limit of GR. So what I want to show you today is that in the same regime of this experiment, there is an effect that you cannot explain with the Newton potential and hence gives a stronger indication of the quantum nature of gravity. So to, uh, to explain that, let us start again very basic and let us look again at the Einstein's equation. So let us start always from that. And yes, okay, so we, we already said that we have classical matter, uh, but what does it mean to have classical matter? So let us consider a classical state of any quantum particle. So ideally, the state of a particle, of a point-like particle, is a point in phase space at some time. So this means that I can perfectly localize this particle both in X, both in P, both in terms of preparation and in terms of measurement. And uh, so the one thing that we haven't included when we consider the limits like the, the, to the Newton potential uh, is, that is also, it's not just that the weak gravitational field is weak and it is in the non-relativistic limit, but also that the source is classical. And we have to keep that in mind when we say, okay, the interaction between these two particles is the Newton potential. So now, let us consider instead a general quantum state. So this quantum state uh, cannot be uh, written as a, as a point in phase space. So the state of a quantum particle has some delocalization, both in X, both in P, that is bounded by the uncertainty principle. So it is impossible to arbitrarily localize a quantum state in X and P. And um, so this means that we have to be a bit more careful when we consider a quantum particle into analyzing our ex basically experimental effects. And we cannot just take for granted that we will have the Newton potential as the effective interaction basically between the a quantum, two quantum particles. Okay, so, but let us first see uh, a case in which this arises because this will clarify both a bit uh, the theoretical framework that in which we are moving and also the assumptions that go, uh, so the justify why in the old previous proposals we can still talk about the Newton potential. So let us consider now a source of gravity that is prepared in a quantum superposition of two localized states, x1 plus x2. So this is what we would write uh, up in, uh, this is what you find in the literature in, uh, on this subject, but these are position eigenstates and we all know that they are not physical. So what this, what this, is, uh, what this actually is, is more like a superposition of coherent states, where each one of these coherent states is localized around X1, so it's a Gaussian, that is localized around X1 and X2, and say momentum equal to zero because we are considering a static source. And the assumption is also that the, um, basically the delocalization of each one of these coherent states, alpha one and alpha two, is small enough that you cannot resolve it within the precision of your experimental apparatus. So the, if 
your state satisfies this condition, then you can make an additional assumption. That is that each one of these coherent states is approximately an eigenvalue of the zero zero component of the stress energy tensor, where the um, eigenfunction of the stress energy tensor is uh, the classical energy density of, uh, um, of a point like particle. And this is since and this is a the one for a static source. Okay, so let us go with this assumption now. So keep this in mind. Now we need to calculate the gravitational field that is associated to a source that is prepared in this state. So the framework that one can use is linearized quantum gravity. What does, what does this mean? I take a decomposition of the, of the metric as a Minkowski background plus a, a perturbation. And then I only quantize the perturbation and treat it as a spin two field on a classical background. So if I do that, then I can write my Lagrangian. So I can write an action for the gravitational field interacting with matter, and this is standard. Uh, then I can take my Legendre transformation to find the Hamiltonian. And then I will find the Hamiltonian that I can quantize. And uh, then if I want to look for the uh, gravitational field that corresponds to the static configuration of gravity, I should be looking at the, for the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Why? Because I have no graviton emission. So the lowest energy state is the one that I care about. And of course, this Hamiltonian is a function of uh, the gravitational field operator and its canonically conjugated momentum. So in addition, we know that gravity is a gauge theory. So we need to add four more gauge conditions. Now, this one, the first one here is called the scalar constraint. And you can see immediately that it is basically the Gauss law. It is the quantum version of the Gauss law. So it, it, this is interesting because, so here we only have, so you see that there is no matter in this uh, Hamiltonian here, but, and the only matter that appears is here in the scalar constraint. So we have a free gravitational theory and the matter is just encoded in the Gauss law. Okay. And then there, there are these three conditions that are called the vector constraint. And this gives us the transversality of the gravitational field. So the same thing that you would have in electromagnetism. Then what you do is you basically just have to solve these equations, keeping in mind that uh, our state is uh, our state for the source is a basically quantum superposition of coherent states, each of them well localized in X and P compared to our experimental resolution. So basically this equation simplifies by a lot because here we just put the classical energy density. So once we do that, and uh, actually the, the framework in which, this is more technical, but the framework in which you can do that is called the, like the field basis of, uh, of the gravitational field. Uh, so basically, it's a basis of eigenvector, uh, eigenvectors of the H operator. Um, then you find that the full state of matter and gravity is uh, uh, this one here. Let us analyze that. So let us forget about matter for a moment, and let us just solve the ground state of the free gravity Hamiltonian. So this is roughly a coherent state. So it's a little bit more complicated than that because of gauge conditions, but it's roughly a coherent state. So it has a Gaussian shape in H and pi. Uh, then we have to add matter. Uh, so notice that of course, like the, the source free state is the same regardless of the matter that I put here. And then what happens is that this state gets modified by this matter, but only by the solution of the classical Gauss law with a classical source. So within our approximation, this uh, equation here becomes the classical Gauss law. So for each one of these alpha one and alpha two, 
we just solve the classical Gauss law and we put it in a quantum superposition. And then at this point, uh, this state uh, becomes different to the one without the source, but just by a classical solution of the gravitational field. And then if you let the source of gravity interact with another particle, then you find that the interaction is Newtonian. So it is described by the Newton potential. So this is the limit in which it is fine to use the Newton potential. But you see, we have to make an approximation that makes basically this equation look pretty classical. So the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. Let us see how. So we have seen that in order to get the Newton potential, we had to consider the superposition of localized Gaussians, alpha 1 and alpha 2. But now, instead, just consider a general quantum source. So no assumptions here, just static uh, quantum source. So in this case, for the superposition of localized Gaussians, we had that the width of each coherent state, alpha 1 and alpha 2, is much smaller than our experimental resolution, both in X and in P. And under these conditions, we could approximate the uh, zero zero component of the stress energy tensor as basically the, uh, so each, each coherent state is an eigenvector for this operator with the classical energy density as its eigenfunction. Now, in the case of a general quantum source, these conditions do not, uh, do not hold anymore uh, in general. And uh, so how do we do that? Well, we know that the T00 operator is basically the Hamiltonian density. So we expand our state in the energy basis and uh, we write the, uh, so we still use a, a, an eigenbasis for, for, for the matter, but where now this eigenfunction is just totally general. Uh, it, it has no relation in principle with this classical energy density. It's just a, gen, a, general, uh, a general function of X and well T, but in the static case, we can forget about T. So now let us consider the simplest situation that we can consider. And uh, so uh, this one is uh, the source of gravity. So the state can be fully general, but the simplest thing that we can think of is a, a wide Gaussian state. So this is enough for our effect. And then we put a, part, a, a test particle state here, P, and initially they are in a product state, these two the source and its gravitational field with the test particle. Then we can write the interaction Hamiltonian between gravity and matter, and this is just the usual interaction Hamiltonian in linearized gravity. And then we let them evolve through this interaction Hamiltonian. And at the end, we find a relative phase that then we can test by making a, a joint measurement on the full state. Uh, where this relative phase has this uh, functional form. So now you can see that GT by H bar is the same function, uh, sorry, it's the same um, uh, constant that are the same constants that appear in the Newton potential. So this is the same order in the gravitational field as the Newton potential. Then there is this C to the fourth that is a bit scary. But remember that these are also in the non-relativistic limit. So each one of these uh, energies here scales as C squared. So basically, in the end, this will cancel out with these two uh, ES once we put the explicit expression for that. But then the, the functional form of these two uh, is not related to the classical energy density. Uh, and it can be anything. So what we, what we did at this point is to see whether we could reproduce this with any model in which gravity is kept classical. So for instance, uh, let us consider models that couple classical gravity to quantum matter 
So uh, these are semi-classical gravity models, for instance, of the type that Jonathan Oppenheim has been working on with collaborators recently. And this cannot be reproduced uh, by this phase because here we have a unitary evolution. So we do not lose visibility, at least uh, I mean, uh, within experimental uncertainty. But in principle, the theory doesn't, it's just unitary. Well, these are stochastic models that are irreversible. And so they, they display both diffusion and decoherence. So they would lead to quantitatively, quantitatively different predictions. Then the second thing we looked at is whether we could find, we could explain it with the Schrodinger-Newton equation. But again, we cannot. So again, the, um, the equations uh, here uh, are like just different. Uh, so it leads again to different predictions. And this is also to be expected because the Schrodinger-Newton equation can be seen in some limits as a mean field model, while again, here everything is, is unitary. So we're not approximating, we're not putting expectation values on anything. Uh, this is just a linear theory. And finally, maybe the most interesting thing is whether we could explain it with some Newton potential and this can only be done, and we'll see this better in the next slide, when this energy has exactly the, the, the form of a classical energy density of a point-like particle. So in general, this cannot be done. And it, so basically the only way you can reproduce this, uh, 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 this phase is by using an ad hoc uh, non-local uh, uh, non uh, potential, uh, the, but we wouldn't know where to take it from, basically. So it's a no-known model that we are aware of. So now let, let us look into that a little bit more in detail. Um, so if, if I take the Newton potential, then I get this equation once I apply it to the state of the source and the particle. So you see that here we have ms and p divided by this. While if we take the full interaction Hamiltonian between gravity and matter, uh, then we find that the interaction Hamiltonian applied to the full state of the source, the gravitational field, and the test particle has this form, where this is basically the part that is mostly interesting for us. Now, this reduces to this expression above when each one of these coherent states can be approximated as a coherent semi-classical state. So as one of these states that we labeled as X, but we know they're actually coherent states. And the classical mass density here uh, is, uh, so E of X is just the classical energy density of the particle. So if I replace these two things here, uh, then I find the, the equation, this previous equation uh, that I have uh, with the Newton potential. So it is, it has a limit to the Newton potential that is well defined, but is in principle more general than the Newton potential. Okay, so, so far we have only considered the interaction Hamiltonian. So if you want, we have used an interaction picture and, and only taken care of the, uh, of the interaction part. But in principle, we have a full Hamiltonian that is composed of the Hamiltonian of the source, the Hamiltonian of the particle, the Hamiltonian of the gravitational field, and the interaction Hamiltonian that we have already discussed. So let us consider the, this a similar setup to what we had before, where we have the source of gravity and its gravitational field, and the test particle um, that is prepared in some general state. So now, um, if since, since we are treating gravity as a quantum field, then we associate a quantum field operator to gravity and to, to its ca canonically conjugated momentum. And these two do not commute. So have standard commutation relation. And here I've just added an alpha as a bookkeeping device. So just to count the number of commutators in, in terms of powers of alpha. And then in the end, we will set alpha to one. So with this, you find immediately that the commutator between the 
Hamiltonian of the free, the free gravitational field and the interaction Hamiltonian does not commute, not even when applied to the quantum state, to the full quantum state. So this means that there is a correction term in the phase that depends on the um, commutator of the gravitational field and its canonically conjugated momentum. What does it look like? So this is the form. So you see here, it's, it's the same uh, constant that we had before, gt by h bar. Uh, there is still this c to the fourth, but we have already justified that. So this is challenge, more challenging because it's higher order in time. And, uh, and then it has a term that is proportional to the first commutator, uh, a, a term that is proportional to the double commutator. And then there would be additional terms in the expansion that, but we neglected them because they were even higher order in time. So now notice that these two functions are not a function of the gravitational field anymore, but only of the probe. So this can be easily uh, checked by performing an experiment uh, and measuring the, the probe and the source. And, uh, and the, the, the bigger disease, basically the, 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 what matters for this term to be big is that the probe is prepared in a, a state that has a different energy profile. So this is the figure of uh, like the, the quantity that matters for that. So again, if we, I had a classical field, even just a classical field for gravity, I would not be able to detect uh, this, these additional corrections. So these are more challenging, but in principle, they are there. And if we measure them, it is a stronger indication that gravity behaves as a quantum field. So that's basically everything I wanted to tell you. So let me just recap the message of this talk. So I think that at the moment, the best statement that we can do when we have gravitational induced entanglement via the Newton potential is that it cannot be explained with general relativity and quantum theory as separate theories. So it is still important to do these experiments because, uh, well, as I, as I mentioned before, all current experiments now rely on general relativity and quantum theory separately. And this would be the first one that cannot be explained in this way. But it makes a lot of difference for experiments, whether this is the best we can achieve or we can do something else. And we have shown that we can do better. And in particular, we have identified the two effects that go beyond the Newton potential, but are the same order in the coupling, where in the same regime of currently proposed experiments. So we have a static quantum source of gravity in a delocalized state. And we have first a dynamical phase uh, that cannot be reproduced with the Newton potential, nor with any non, at least to us, model of, uh, in which gravity is classical. And the second one is, uh, is the effect of the quantum commutator between the gravitational field operator and its canonically conjugated momentum that appears as a correction term in the phase. And this would be a test of the role of gravity as a quantum mediator. So these effects, importantly, are not relative in the non-relativistic regime and do not depend on graviton emission, which is usually the uh, other regime that is considered for to claim meaningfully that we have a quantum effect in gravity. And uh, to me, this is, uh, this is nice because it allows us to plan a new generation of experiments that tests quantum aspects of gravity in a broader sense. And now what we have to do is to look at the concrete implementation of these uh, effects and to give some numerical estimates of where this effect would place. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kundanini. Do we Thanks. have any questions from Jen? Yes, we could uh, okay, start with questions from audience. Uh, so for audience, so. right? Yes. Um, 
I guess I can start. Yeah, thank you, Flaminia. That was a really, really nice talk. And yeah, really thanks for making the time for us. Uh, in the um, yeah, this is, of course, very, uh, very interesting. And I was wondering whether there, um, so essentially, um, it seems to me that the, that the gist is to recognize that if there is a general quantum state, uh, GR will predict that it's um, energy sources gravity. Uh, and therefore, one can uh, one can go beyond the Newtonian limit in a sense of just the mass source in gravity. Yeah. Um, so I wonder whether it is as simple as that. In a sense, if I if um, I estimate the energy of a Gaussian state uh, and then plug it in a, as a value uh, in uh, well in this uh, e squared over delta x equation, I mean only integrated, um, or is there some specific uh, role of uh, keeping both the matter and gravitational degrees of freedom or can i yeah essentially can i estimate the energy of a state plug it in and get the the correct phase or there's some subtlety there so roughly yes the the subtlety is that we uh, so uh, the t00 is written uh, as a field basically so what you would have to do is to find how like the correct limit in which uh, this field reduces to, because in the end, in the laboratory, you treat matter as, as like with first quantization, so as a, as a quantum particle. And so you, you would have to find how that, from the field, you recover the, the limits to matter. And then at that point, you can, do, you can just plug it in. But as long as you are able to write a function, like a local function of, of the energy, then you're good. Yeah. Okay, then I will follow up. It kind of goes against what I guess I would uh, usually argue for. So this is a bit tongue in cheek. Um, and so let's say we take the atomic physics approach and we say, well, we know that the mass of atoms have a lot of binding energy. Um, when you talk with some particle physicists, depending what matter you include, it will be all energy um, coming from Higgs field or something else. Um, so why can't we uh, just use this argument and say, well, already, already the cow experiment, uh, well, maybe neutrons don't have so much binding energy. I don't know whether it's because yeah, it seems, uh, yeah, it seems um, there is, uh, and I intuitively agree that there is an importance yeah, that adding energy, of course, goes um, as a source of gravity that takes us away from the Newtonian limit understood as, as masses. Um, but then, yeah, taking uh, in all the all the knowledge we have about mass and how it's composed, uh, that seems then to open some ambiguity when this energy is relevant. Uh, is it relevant that it cannot be yeah, a static fixed value that we can reinterpret as mass? Or is there any quantitative difference one could look for um, to say, well, that's the energy that somehow goes beyond the, the static energy that I can reinterpret as a mass of a particle. So okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not fully sure what you, <laughs> what you asked. OK, yeah, then I'll try to, sorry, I'll try to uh, simplify. So this is a, this is a, um, a devil's advocate type, type argument. Yeah, if energy is important, why can't I just say, well, this atom uh, in, say, Kasevich experiment, um, when I say mass, I actually mean energy. And we know from many experiments that, uh, that yeah, it, we cannot uh, reproduce correctly the, the value of the mass, energy, just counting mass uh, of uh, individual nucleons. And even that is ambiguous uh, because we have theories that say, well, it's all energy. So why mm -hmm. is that energy not sufficient? to say, well, now we are going beyond Newtonian limit because we have energy that sources gravity. Well, OK, but because you need to have a, like a delocalization. So the delocalization in position is, is important. And as far as I know, there is no source of gravity that you can really delocalize uh, uh, so much in position. So if I take a wide wave packet of a single atom, and then its energy is likewise yeah, delocalized. But it's not a source of gravity, right? So you cannot show that it is a source of gravity experimentally. Well, let's say if I measure a cow face and then I get that it's proportional to M, but yeah. then I know that M is actually E over C squared. 
Yes, yes, no, but the cow face oh, yeah, is the, due to this. What's the yeah. distinction between yeah, the, the energy of the wave packet versus the energy stored in the, in the mass? Yeah, but so the, the, the cow energy is uh, the, the source of gravity is the Earth, not the particle in the interferometer. Well, it's Newtonian potential, so they come uh, in exact the same bilinear form as in your expression. There is the E, the N times M. Yeah, but, but the, I guess the, we can also the, the, yeah. the Earth is, is, is in the localized uh, regime. That's okay. So then let's uh, let's compare it to to G um, the the gravity generated entanglement with the uh, local well with the with other wave packets. So essentially, but the question is really: is there something that distinguishes where from the energy is coming? Is it uh, is it important that it comes from yeah. no, it, um, yes, it, the center of mass or that it comes from uh, internal energy? Because it seems to me that's somehow what distinguishes the wave packet versus okay, okay, the, okay. The no, no, I get, okay, no, I, I, I start getting where you're where you're going. So uh, I think that the calculations we have so far would hold for the just the center of mass. So with a, for a single like single particle that is uh, whose only relevant degree of freedom is the center of mass. And actually, if you want to consider a composite particle, then the calculation is much harder. So it's uh, because, yeah, you would, yeah. Uh, so there are some technicalities that when you do the calculation, because uh, of, so it's related to the choice of gauge, basically. And, uh, <laughs> So you need to first assume a background, then you do the like you take the Minkowski background, then you have to calculate what the effect of the particle that is on that background. But it's easy to do it if you only have one single source. If you have more sources, then you cannot use the same approximation anymore. And then maybe there there is some subtlety. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I think that that really clarifies things for taking okay. the time. To go. <laughs> yeah. I'll guess I leave the space for other people to ask. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks. Hi. Am I allowed to ask anything or? Yeah, okay. Hi, Flaminia. Thanks. Um, so a natural question that comes to mind, especially based on what you said at the beginning, is what happens if you apply all this to electromagnetism? Can this approach be used to show that a different way than what, what Clauser did of showing that electromagnetism has to be quantum? Or what would yes. be the obstruction in that? Yeah, so actually, so we, we the the thing for electromagnetism works exactly in the same way, but it's even simpler, the calculation. Uh, it's because it's uh, the electromagnetism is just simpler to calculate. So we didn't do it, but it's uh, it goes exactly in the in the in the same way. So in the in the paper where we recover the, the, the Newton potential, uh, we have also the calculation for electromagnetism. So the formalism it can definitely be applied for that. And it's actually interesting because in the case of electromagnetism, this could be a, a good proof of principle experiment that maybe could be even realized. So that's something that we would like to look into. That's what I was thinking. I mean, one should estimate the numbers for electromagnetism yeah. for the decoherence time and the corrections yeah. uh, presumably will be a lot, a lot bigger, right? <laughs> because of the yeah. nature of the force. I mean, it seems to me that's a separate problem that's worth considering um, in and of itself. Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. so we're in agreement on that. All right, thank you. Okay, let's remember to unmute this time. Uh, does anyone else have any questions in the audience? doesn't look like there's any more questions. And in that case, um, I'd like to thank you again for, uh, for giving your talk. Thank you. Thank um, you, Flamia. Thanks. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.